Today we're talking about particles. Specifically, we started implementing particles on stream the other day. And if you start taking a look at these particles that we have on screen, they are not quite what we had when we were on stream, but they are quite nice. They are not super intense effects. Then we're not doing flip books. We're not doing sprites. These are just particles on screen as the meteors all blow up, but they do cause the effect quite nicely. So first and foremost, we're using Bevy Hanabi for doing these particle effects whenever a meteor or the ship explodes. This is a GPU driven particle library that uses compute shaders. This means that it is not currently compatible with Wasm. So keep that in mind if you do decide to use this library. It is also notable that this library seems like it's going to undergo some changes over the next couple of versions for various different reasons. What we talk about in this video seems like it will continue to be valid for uh, version 0 0.11, although the API specifics for adding things like properties will change. So let's get into what we've got going on here. The first thing we need is vertex writable storage. This is a WGPU setting that we need to enable in the render creation field of the render plugin. Render plugin, of course, is a bevy plugin. We also have to add the Hanabi plugin to get these particle effects. The vertex writable storage WGPU feature, so we're in the WGPU docs right now, enables binding writable storage buffers and textures visible to vertex shaders. So the main sequence here is we need to register our effect and then we can use that effect wherever we want. In this case, we are trying to fire an effect based on an event. So we'll be framing everything in that way, but you can have spawners that live for a long time on a specific entity for whatever reason you want to. So we've got this system register meteor effect. This happens on startup to construct the effect that we are going to use whenever we run the event. In this case, we're using spawner once, which spawns count particles or the number that we put in. Notably, we're using false here and a number of particles that is 100. This false means that when we call reset later, we're going to get a new burst of particles whenever we call reset. This is one of the features of this effect spawner that allows us to actually fire these on command. The next piece here is actually very important and is hidden somewhat in the docs. We've got this EXPR writer. EXPR is short for expression, but what Bevy Hanabi is doing is basically dynamically writing shaders out and using those to power the particles. Because we're dynamically writing shaders out, we don't get to use Rust code to define the math for how these particles behave. We have to write through an interface that then defines the shader code that is compiled and run and that lives over on the GPU. So this expert writer is basically like a facade interface to writing a WGSL shader. Now this is not entirely accurate or exactly accurate. A lot of the code is already written for us, specifically a lot of the WGSL code. We don't have to ever write any WGSL in this situation, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. Writer has a number of functions as you can see here. We've got literals, we've got the ability to handle props. In this case, spawn color is a custom prop. And we've got the ability to do, you know, random values of different kinds. So the age of our particle when it spawns is going to be zero. And the way we get this to work is we use one of these attribute modifiers. We construct it for the attribute that we care about. And we use this expression as what the value needs to be when it's initialized. If you've ever written a compute shader before, these typically have sort of an initialization phase or can have an initialization phase and then have an update phase that runs many times. In this case, we're using set attribute modifier. These are all built in attributes. And in fact, if you click on attribute in the left-hand side here, you can see a lot of the constants. So this is things like the lifetime of the particle, the position of the particle, uh, the sprite index, if you're using something like a flipbook, or the velocity, the color, things like that. Set attribute modifier implements a trait or actually a couple of traits, such as init modifier and also update modifier. So if we use set attribute modifier and we construct it with the age attribute and an expression to determine what that should be, then this init age variable is something we can use in the initialization phase of our effect asset. So this is the initialization phase of that compute shader. Before we get into too many more of these expressions, this effect asset is the thing that we are adding so that we can use and spawn later. We pass the effect asset the maximum number of particles that we want to spawn in the scene. In this case, 32,768. The spawner that we initialized earlier and our finished module that contains all of our expressions. The name here doesn't really matter that much, not for the operation of the effect anyway. 
we define a custom property called spawn color with an initialization of basically FF, 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 which if you've ever worked with, you know, color in CSS is white and opaque. We do a couple of other initializations for the position, the velocity, the age, the lifetime, and the color. In our update cycle, we update the drag of the particles, which we'll get into in a second. And when we render them, we render them at a specific size. In this case, these are true screen size pixels. So if this was a single pixel, it would be literally a single pixel on this 4K monitor that I'm showing right now. In this case, it's three. And this set size modifier is similar very much to what we just looked at. So we go along and we build up a lot of these set attribute modifiers, right? So we uh, set the lifetime to 1.5 seconds and we set that to the lifetime attribute using the set attribute modifier. Our drag uses a linear drag modifier with a value of two. Our color or our initialized color, the starting color, it's going to take that spawn color prop, which we can set later in our code, that's very important. And we set that to the color attribute. In this case, we're setting the spawn color for every pixel in that group. So every time roughly we send reset, all of those pixels will have the same color. So if you look at the groupings here, if I hit once, then we get all blue. Over here is all pink or purple. I don't know what that was. There's another like pinkish purple, there's some white, there's yellow. So we're kind of randomizing this a little bit, which we'll look into later. But that spawn color attribute that we're randomizing is setting that pixel color for the entire group. We've then got two interesting initializations, the position and the velocity. In this case, we get predefined set position circle modifier and set velocity circle modifier. This allows us to define a circle and a direction out of that circle. So for example, each of these meteors is roughly a circle shaped object. We want to spawn the pixels from some center in some circle going in some direction with some speed. And these are all more expressions. So Vec3y is a constant that is basically 0, 1, 0. Vec3z is 0, 0, 1. Tau is basically 2 pi. It's once around a circle. And then the velocity is set from some center through some axis with some speed. In this case, we're using rand and 200. So rand on a scalar type, which also comes from Bevi Hanavi. In this case, we're doing a float. You can also do a number of other things like vex. We're multiplying 200 by a random float, which is a number from zero to one. So the speed of these particles will be somewhere from zero to one, which is then multiplied by 200. And there's a lot for all of these expressions. It's pretty deep. If you've never written WGSL shaders before, you'll probably run into some uh, type mismatches because this interface isn't particularly well typed at the moment. I don't know if it will be in the future, but you can very easily get yourself into a situation using this API currently where you try to pass in the wrong value because these are all abstracted. So with all that in mind, we do need to spawn our particle effect bundle with that effect. We need to spawn the spawner with it. And then effect properties is what gives us access to this spawn color. The name of course is not super important. It's just some debugging material. So now that our effect is spawned into the world, we can go down into our meteor destroyed event handler. And this meteor event handler queries for the effects that we have in the world. In this case, we're kind of just querying for anything. So if we had multiple, we would get multiple. We do a quick check to make sure that the effect has been spawned in due to the life cycle or the schedule in which it is actually activated. In our case, because we're using events, this never fires, but I do like pulling these uh, properties out of that effect query anyway. We then read out of our events for every meteor that was getting destroyed. We construct a color using LCH because that happens to be my favorite way to construct colors today. These two values are lightness and chroma. They're a value from zero to 1.5. For certain colors, chromas that can be too high are not valid, so I kept it low. I also kept the lightness to one. And then I'm producing a random F32 using the rand crate from zero to one, multiplying that by 360 to give us one of the colors. And we use those properties that we had earlier to set that spawn color as a linear RGBA U32. So the what you would think of as a VEC4 with RGBA F32 values or something like that, gets packed into a U32 to be sent into the shader. So remember, this color is defined for each meteor. That's why we see a different color whenever each meteor gets destroyed. And our spawner spawns these particles whenever we hit reset, so we have to call reset. And fundamentally, that's really all there is here. We define our effect, we insert it into the world, we set any properties we need to set, and then we spawn the particles. 
Now, when I phrase it like that, it seems super easy, but it actually can be quite hard to understand, especially since a lot of this is not quite uh, well typed because we're working in WGSL land. But you can see that we are getting a number of particles. Uh, we didn't really talk about the drag, but the drag is why these aren't careening off the screen. So for the drag, we're using a expression literal that is just the number two with a linear drag modifier. And we're doing that in the update stage of our compute shader. And if we go to the documentation, it says a modifier to apply a linear drag force to all particles in each frame, the force slows down the particles without changing their direction. So this modifier affects the velocity effectively without changing the direction that our particle is moving in. Altogether, this is pretty powerful. Also pretty easy to misuse at this point, especially if you don't have any familiarity with WGSL shaders, because all of this expression stuff is basically an interface into that. In addition, there's a whole bunch of things we didn't talk about. For example, if you were going to change the color of a particle over its lifetime, you could use a gradient, either linear or something that you define yourself with a bunch of stops. There are things like a flipbook modifier and the ability to use sprites. A flipbook, if you're unfamiliar with it, is basically just a set of sprites that you flip through, similar to an old book. And thus you could actually, for every pixel on the screen, like we just saw, we had 100. In this case, this example is running 32, it looks like. You could run a flipbook for each of those particles on the screen. So again, that's a quick look at Bevy Hanabi. There are a bunch of examples as I scroll down this readme, doing various things, spinning, shooting particles out, changing gradients over time. There are force fields in Bevy Hanabi, as well as the ability to turn particles on and off due to visibility. You are fully capable of defining how your particles spawn. So for example, in this ball bouncing around, the particles never go outside of bounds because of the way that they're defined using the normal of the intersection. And there's of course a lot more to do in this crate. This crate does look like it's actually going to undergo some changes in the near future. So I tried to keep it reasonably high level. If we go and look back at what looks like it's going to be the 0 0.11 update, you can see how we had this expert writer we talked about that earlier, and now the API gets a little bit simpler. So instead of the effect asset having a with property, we get writer add property, basically the same stuff here. When you have a scalar, you have a scalar and so on. So I hope you enjoyed this look into Bevy Hanabi. It is one of my favorite particle crates. There are other particle crates, especially if you're looking to target something like WebGL or have better browser support. Bevy Hanabi is not the most browser supporting <laughs> crate out there at the moment. However, Compute-based particle effects are very cool, and you can achieve quite a few things with them. So that's it for today. I will see you in the next video. Have a great rest of your day.